Hey guys, welcome back to Beast Quest Series 9. Book 1, Ursus the Clawed Roar. And it's great to be out of Series 8, to move on to other things. Here we are, Series 9. Malva is back, and uh, I'm glad to be out of some people's way. Now, before we start, I want to say I appreciate Malvel more as a villain. He's still lame with a typical, I am bad guy, I want to rule the kingdom and all that. But the reason why I didn't like him compared to Veltman was because he was a more personal threat to Tom, which got into under his skin, which is why I liked him more. But Malvel is a serious threat too, because he, he's more of a, he affects others than himself, which still, like, he wants to take over everything. Which is boring, but it also is very threatening at the same time, so... I do have a bit more respect for him now. Senpei is still weakest link to me as the villains. But with that being said, um, we move on back to Malvel's tactics of uh, making beasts from good formula. So that's gonna be awesome. And that being said, let's start things off with Ursus the Clawed Roar. Tom and friends were riding to Uncle Henry's for the reunion with his family. After they saw Talaron and Freya, a huge feast was prepared for their return in Arenal. But then, Adro showed up, and after not eating, Tom knew something was up. Adro asked Tom to gather Freya, Talaron, and Eleanor to meet him in the stables, where he explained Malva was back and up to his tricks again. Tom and Eleanor were needed at the castle. Freya and Talaron wanted to come too, but Adro said they were needed at Wildor. Using his new magic, he made the, the Tree of Being appear and take Taladon and Freya into Gwildor. Tom, Eleanor, Storm and Adoro head, were heading back to the castle and Adoro thought it was best they left Blizzard behind for this one. At the castle, they were, they were too late. Adoro opened a hidden chamber and saw that the Warlock's staff had been taken by Malvel. The staff, give, the staff is given to a person to give them great power. But even better, if you burn the staff in the eternal flame, you can become invincible. Tom asked why he never mentioned this before, and Adder explained it was a secret passed down from wizard to wizard. The flame was located in a sacred kingdom called Seraph, a place where no beasts and purest of fruits and waters grew. Also, without the staff in its rightful place, Adder was dying, and if Tom didn't return the staff back, Adder would be gone forever. Pretty big step there. Tom and Eleanor were sad to see Adro die, but Eleanor believed if they could get the staff back, that would save Adro and bring him back. Now that's, this is just a theory, but I don't know if it's going to work for sure. It was worth a shot, after all they had to stop Malvel before he did become a big threat. Adro had some items which he must have been planning to give to Tom and Eleanor. There were six tokens, they took them, and despite Adro telling them not to go to Seraph, they had they had to, in hopes of saving their friend and stopping Malvo from, from becoming invincible. They found a chamber of stairs and they called their animals Storm and Silver and reached for Seraph, where they encountered Petra. Now before I go on, I want to say, Arrow right there, if Arrow is, one of his lines was he didn't want them to go to Seraph. That's kind of a, not, not, not something I expect from Adro, because... You, he says that if you get this staff, um, if Malvel destroys this staff, he will become invincible. And we all know that he's, his goal is to take over the kingdoms. And he tells them not to go to Seraph? That's a bit questionable because you're basically putting the kingdom in danger, but whatever. I guess he's just that worried for Tom and Eleanor. But then again, I don't understand why, because the only thing dangerous in Seraph is Malvel and his sidekick, which we'll get to later on. But, you know, that aside. Um, so we're introduced to what was it, Petra. Let me just get to this character. Uh, Petra was an enemy they had fought before against a beast called Mortax in a previous book, like a special. She is Malvel's minion and has, has had escaped since then. There was no doubt she would have returned to her master. She had an anagram. Uh, before we go on, I want to say, if she did, was out there, why didn't she break him out of prison? That's a good plot hole right there, but oh well. Um, she had an anacorn called Noctis. Now I want to say, before I go, no, go on, 
In the book, it's called a unicorn, but it's not really a unicorn because it has wings like a Pegasus. So, I'm getting this information off My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, that um, t there's a character in there called Twilight Sparkle, and they call that race of creatures anicorns, so I'm going off that. If, you know, that's how I'm going off that. Um, so, Petra has an anicorn called Noctis, and they go, they all got into a scuffle. And after some injuries from both Tom and Eleanor, they managed to repel the witch and get get loose of something from her tunic. She couldn't try getting it back now as her wand had been snapped in the fight. So she made a retreat on Noctis and claimed that Malfoy was planning to have Beast for Sarah. Now before I go on, it is another thing I want to point up. Um, well actually, I'll mention that in the next part, so. They were, yeah, they were, yeah. They received a vision of Petra using her magic to create a beast by turning a average bear into a monstrous beast. They realized that Petra had dropped a map, and it revealed the location of the Eternal Flame and the first beast name, Ursus. A nice reference to Ursa Major, the Great Bear, or in other terms, the Big Dipper, the constellation of the stars. They ventured forth and encountered some villagers who explained that Ursus, Ursus was once an animal loved by the people. Tom revealed that Malva and Petra were from his kingdom, and he planned to put things right. Now this is where I want to stop, because I need to point out that it's a bit convenient that Adro has six tokens for six beasts that he didn't know at the time were going to be created. Unless he's Malavel's that predictable to always make six beasts. Um, another thing I want to point out, it's, a bit, it's also convenient that Petra has a map on her, that not only reveals the location of the Eternal Flame, but the beast itself. So that's a bit convenient too. But oh well. Uh, so, uh, and another thing I want to, actually before I go on, I want to say, Marvel's plan in this series is to get the Eternal Flame. So why doesn't he just use his magic to just take him there? It, it wouldn't take him that much trouble, seeing how he's the Dark Wizard. But... Oh well, I guess that's a bit... You gotta ignore some things in order for there to be a story. Unless there's a good reason though. Whatever. Um, where was I at? Tom and Eleanor had a meal and the people advised them to put rabbit droppings to hide their scent. Tom and Eleanor also wondered if the harp would have any effect on Ursus, as they didn't want to kill the beast. But he headed for the forest and reached Ursus' spot, the waterfall, and from behind the showering curtain was the beast. Ursus had emerged. He was bigger than he was three times bigger than the ordinary bear. They lay on a cliff. Tom tried to get out of the harp. Yeah, he tried to get the harp out, but Ursus made his way up the cliff. So Tom took out the purple jewel, which blasted part of the cliff and sent the rubble pushing Ursus back. Eventually, he came back. That is Ursus. Eleanor had got Storm and Silver out of there, only to remind himself that the tokens were inside Storm's saddlebag. So he had to race back after his companions. But then Storm had his legs tag tangled in some vines. So Tom tried to cut him free, but Ursus was right upon them. Tom managed to get the, ha the harp from Storm and just in time and managed to you know, make Storm get out of there and retreat. However, despite him using the harp to put Tarfiz to sleep, Malval used a thunder spell to wake him up, destroying the ha allowing Ursus to destroy the harp and leaving nothing but strings. Eleanor made a distraction using her arrows, trying not to hit him but a nearby area, but not the beast as he was an act like an innocent creature of course. The tactic proved to be to, to prove to be annoying Ursus and he caught this caused him to destroy Eleanor's bow. She hid behind a tree while Silver got into a into got in there planning to annoy um his power using his powerful agility. Eleanor and Tom made a new bow for Eleanor out of a piece of bamboo and the remaining harp strings. Eleanor used her arrow tactic again and with the help of Storm and Silver outmaneuvering him, he began to lose his balance. But as Eleanor fired, Ursus slipped on some mud, moving his chest straight into one of the Eleanor's arrows. The beast crashed into the lake and blood drip was dripping from his body and everyone was shocked because, you know, they think he's dead. Uh, turns out Ursus, of course, is not dead. The strings of the strings of the harp actually did help in a way that was not expected. Ursus's curse had been lifted, and he reverted back to his original lovable self. They brought the cave dwellers protector back to the 
to their home, back to them, and they celebrated their victory. Tom and Eleanor, this time, they were going to finish off Malvel for, for good. That's what they say. They say, let's finish off Malvel for good and all that. Does that mean they plan to kill him? Probably not, but that would be interesting. And after all, we saw how prison worked, and that didn't stop him. So maybe Tom and Eleanor will come to a conclusion that death is the only way, unless they redeem him, which I doubt. So it would be nice to see them kill Malvel. I'm not... These are the good guys, though. They're probably not going to do that, and he's probably going to get away again. Tom and Eleanor head out forth to continue their adventure on Seraph. So. And that's the uh, end of versus the Accord War. Overall, I can't really say much about the first book because it falls into the category of this is only the first book, and it relies a bit on setup in order to get the ball rolling. So, I can't really compare, and besides, the way I rate my books is I compare them to the others in the series down the line, so... That's what we got there. Overall, though, I do really like this series, so... I do like this series so far. Um, it's got Malvel in, again. As I've said before, he is... I have um, underestimated him, but he's still low. But, um, but he, there are a few nitpicks I had with him in this um, series, this series, this first one. The fact that he has, a, a, um, he has Petra with him now, as a... A goon or a minion, which is kind of cool. So he doesn't have to go. Well, he he sends beasts out, but he, it's nice to have him have a like a personal minion. I mean, he did before with Seth, who was the scorpion guy eventually. So that was cool. Uh, I was like a nice callback to series three. So it's nice to have Petra in there as a new side tool. Um, Adro dying. Um, that's a nice plot device. Plot device to use. Um. Um, what else did I like? Um, well, Blizzard was in it. They they did remove some characters. They got rid of um, Taladon, Freya, and Blizzard. Some of the mo point the uh, characters we could have done without. Um, King Hugo wasn't in, in this one, which which I understand. And yeah, I did like the reunion bit of them getting together and all that. Um, actually, I did like some of the drawings of um, Ursus in the book. It's pretty cool. So. And I did like that a bear got in there too, with, under the the um, stuff. So overall, though, I can't really rate this book, but I will say it is a good start. And I I, I do like the whole plan of the eternal flame and the staff becoming invincible. And I like the whole world, the whole world itself called Seraph. That's a nice name. And the fact that Malvo has to create beasts from ordinary creatures is a nice concept which I haven't seen him do before and I don't think any other villain has used this tactic before so and it does lead into an exciting book that I'm actually hyped to see down the road which I'm not going to say but if you know the book I'm on about you'll know um, so that being said this has been my review on Beast Quest Ursus the Cord Raw hope you guys have enjoyed it and we'll be moving on to Minus, the Demon Bull. Till next time. Hey guys, welcome back to Beast Quest. Series 9, Book 2. Minus, the Demon Bull. And as you can tell by the title, and by the review, uh, yeah, and by the book, of course, this is the 50th book, and of course, my 50th review on Beast Quest. So, of course, this is a... Quite an accomplishment. First of all, I, if people have been watching uh, my Beast Quest reviews, I want to say thank you for um, staying with me and watching them all the way through. Or if you've watched them one by one and just picked up, I'm glad to see you've made it all the way to review number 50. So with that being said, I'm going to break it down to the overall story and of course get my overall thoughts on this book. Alright, let's do this. For the 50th time, Beast Quest. Tom and Anna head on their quest to stop Malvar from destroying the Warlock Staff and tossing it into the Eternal Flame. They had, they had to be ready, as he could turn, it, turn any simple creature into a deadly beast. When they prepared their, for shelter, they sensed a storm is coming, no doubt the work of Malvar to slow down our heroes. Just then, a tree came crashing down upon them. Storm avoided the tree, after... After a while facing the storm, they encountered Malvel with the Warlock's staff. 
He bragged about how they couldn't beat him. Now Adro was dead, and Tom vowed he would beat them. Yeah, beat them. Mallow got pissed and sent the lightning, lightning coming after them their way. Yeah. So Tom charged through, facing the storm, dodging the lightning bolts. Eventually, Malville made a craters all around the area. Tom also claimed he would destroy Malville this time, which does indicate that Tom does want to kill Malville. Also, Tom noticed a shadowy figure in the distance. So, it does add to the... A while back on the Ursus, I said they, want, they had to end him for good, and I didn't... It was indicating they wanted to kill him, but this, of course, fully admits that they do want to kill him. Well, Tom does, at least. And yeah, so, and where Tom and, 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 you know, no, Tom, yeah, Tom and Storm, sorry. And where Tom and Storm were standing, standing, Malva destroyed the ground which they were standing on, and Tom and Storm fell. Eleanor attempted a rescue only to have her ledge break and, as well. Eleanor, Tom, Storm and Silver all fell. Tom was the first to wake up from his fall, second was Eleanor, then Storm and Silver joined them. Malva had left it, left, Eleanor assumed he had come to the conclusion that the heroes were dead. But when Tom searched the saddlebag, it was empty. He remembered the person in the storm. He assumed it was Petra. So they used Storm to get... No, not Storm, Silver, to get their scent from the bag and chase her down. They reached some plains and saw the thief on the run. Eleanor let out a warning shot, and Tom ha had the thief only to reveal it wasn't Petra, but a girl Tom had never seen before. So... Tom apologised for assuming her to be someone else. She explained she stole the tokens as she thought they were food and the riders had died in the storm. She was hoping to give the food, this food to her mother, who was trapped under the, their wrecked home, which Minus the demon bull had destroyed. She also explained that Minus changed when a young woman fed the bull strange food. Tom and Ellen knew it was Petra. They got to the village and rescued the girl's mother. And they also heal her using the combination of the green jewel to heal her broken bones and Epos's healing talent. But then Minus had returned and was charging it right at them. Tom faced Minus on the ground while Elena was trying to shoot up arrows from the from her vantage point. While the villagers remained safe in their hut, however, Elena's arrows seemed to have no effect as they bounced right off Minus, his thick hide, of course. Tom had an idea and created a second shield made of grass, which actually proved very useful. It avoided Minus. It Avoided Minus once, and on the second time he used it to blind Minus, allowing Tom to get his to get on his back. Eventually, um, he was booked off, and Tom was right under the beast. Silver came to help before Minus could tramp be trampled. You know, Minus could be trampled, Tom. But soon Silver was tossed off. But Tom had been given enough time to jump out of the way, only to be knocked by one of Minus's horns as he reformed his jump. He wobbles, trying to steady himself, but then Minus used his tail to coil up Tom's legs, and Minus began man, to drag Tom across the ground. I think this has happened before with, um, Tigus, maybe? Um, Tom was be beginning, was being dragged, of course, through the village, despite Eleanor's efforts to save Tom. The arrows bounced off Minus's hide, but eventually Tom got his sword back. As he was being dragged with all his strength, he cut Minus's tail off. The beast ran off in, in pain, while Tom untangled the tail from his legs. Tom and Anna decided, since they didn't know which token to use, an option was to try and communicate to Minus and calm the beast down to allow Tom to put a rope on him. And they tried it for a couple of minutes, and it appeared to be working until Petra shows up on Noctis and whipped the beast to attack them. Back under the spell, Minus was ready to fight. At least it was a nice attempt to try something else, you know, besides the tokens. Even if it was a fail attempt, it was still nice to see other ways of do dealing with beasts. Tom was, avo was avoiding Minus's attacks, and then Eleanor helped out making Minus back off. Tom had figured out a plan to beat Minus, and he believed that the harness was the right tool for the beast, for this beast. But then Jenka and her mother came out, and Minus went after them. Tom called for Storm and rode on, rode on after them. Eventually, he got there and coiled the remains of Minus's tail on him. Tom was flung off Storm, and he had plummeted to the ground again. He keeps flinging to the ground and stuff. Tom nudged aside and prepared to his plan by asking Ellen to ride Storm as a decoy while Tom climbed the totem pole in the village. When Minus passed, passed by Tom, he leapt, eventually securing the harness on Minus. On Minus. He then le le lured him back around towards the totem pole and flipped over his face, also loosening his sword. Yeah, he lost his sword in the process. 
Tom wrenched on Minus's horns, and Eleanor told Tom he, he has to get out of there or he could be killed within the impact. Because he's heading right for the turning pole, and if he hits, it's going to smash. Boom. Of course, Tom gets out there as the last possible moment, and the totem pole broke. Adro's magic had taken effect, and Minus had been reverted back to his normal size. Tom removed the harness. I'm unsure if Tom still has the harness, or he left it behind. But anyway, Minus is free from Petra's magic, and brings back the cow, which also brings back the villagers who see the cow as well. Tom explains how Minus acted this way. They offered a feast for their victory, but of course, Tom declines, saying their quest is more important. You know, at this point, I roll my eyes. At this point, I got sick of Tom ignoring hospitality after being a beast. We all know how hard it is for a young warrior and his companions to do a, to do this. Luckily, Jenka's mother insists they take a food bag with them for their journey, so I'm glad that this book acknowledges that. So, thank you. They ride off and see a vision of Malvel, but before they could react to it, it faded, hearing a distant laugh of Petra. Their quest wasn't over, it had only just begun. And with that, guys, that is the 50th Beast Quest review acknowledged in all story. Overall, this is easier, better than Ursus, because one, it focuses more on the beast, because it doesn't rely on setup. But there are a few other little tiny details that I like about it that are finally acknowledged here. Or they might have been a lot acknowledged previously, but I think this one does it right. Tom, and many, many quests, does ignore hospitality, always puts the quest first, but I like to see there are some compassionate people who do take effort in all his work. So it's nice to have, dude, just take a break, you need the energy, if you want to get, I mean, I know you want to beat the beast quest and all that, but you need energy in order to do that, so please, take the hint. So, yeah, that's good. Um, also in this book, Tom gets tr nearly trampled on Myers uh, quite a few times, it's very intense actually. And luckily he's able to outthink it and he does get more creative by using other plans besides the tokens with the um, jewels he had before. And uh, Eleanor got a bit of a back roll this book, but it was nice to see Tom doing other means of stopping the job. Yep, um, I'm unsure if he left the harness behind, or also minus his tail got cut off, I'm assuming that healed after the spell broke, hopefully. Either way, Minus the Demon Bull is a vast improvement from Ursus because one is not set up and it does acknowledge a few things that not only in Series 9 has, but overall the series problem was, as I've stated before. Still, that is an obvious reason to call this an awesome book, as well as it being the 50th one. And I believe our next review will be Koraka. If I'm pronouncing that name right, but I'm going to pronounce it that way anyway. So until next time guys, like, subscribe, all the good stuff. And thank you for sticking with me and watching 50 reviews of the Beast Quest series. But that being said, until next time guys, peace. Hey guys, welcome back to Beast Quest. Series 9, Book 3, Koraka. The Winged Assassin. And I have to say, reluctantly, this is the worst book so far of Series 3. I hate to say that, but it is. Even worse, of, even worse than Ursus. And the reason is, well, yeah, I will point out what the good elements are and the bad, but first, of course, let's go over the story. Tom and Elena were desperate for food, and after the defeat of Minus the, after the defeat of Minus the Bull, this is where a major oh my god moment from the last book, as they were given a food bag from Jenka's mother after defeating Minus, and if Tom was so concerned with food, he should have taken that feast offer from the last book. So, and um, to be honest, this goes on for a bit with Tom going on about the food struggle, which is a big major. To what happened in the last book, if you remember in my review on Minus, I said that Tom was given a food bag from Jenka's mother. Now, the only thing that outstretches this, I guess, is if that Tom ate the food before off without us seeing it, you know? But why would they acknowledge it without, or, you know, why would they bring that up as a food source? Unless, 
so that uh, us as viewers put on our heads, okay, Tom has this food supply now, but now he doesn't. And, if everyone's, and I can imagine other people be thinking the same thing as me. The only explanation is this was this the food bag was eaten off off reading time, you know, not in the books, but like on their travels without us, you know, reading it. So on, on we go. Tom and Eleanor reach the field and discover a broken a broken butt bit trap where with there only being one trap. I can strongly assume that that's where Cora, the shepherdess, was turned into her beast form. Because in the prologue, that's what happened. Uh, the shepherdess was turned and was caught in a trap. Also, there was a wound, a wounded mother sheep and a baby. Tom healed the mother sheep and Marvel showed up claiming that he had reached the eternal flame. Tom still vows to kill Marvel, by the way. Of course, Tom explains if Malville had reached the Eternal Flame, he would have no need to send a beast out after him. Since they checked the map earlier and several elements pointed to there being another beast, with the dead sheep and the damaged trees still in, still in search for food, they came across a town and, en and enter an empty house. Not wanting to steal, they leave the harp from, the, from Ursus behind. Mind you, last time I checked, that harp was destroyed by Ursus in his mouth. Which Tom and Ellen, so which Tom must have some remaining gold fragments from it. I'm guessing. However, before Tom and Ellen acted, acted the owner re returned, lightly pissed before Tom and Ellen could explain the situation. Yeah, so angry. So the angry mob ensues, and they capture our heroes. Tom and Ellen were taken to the stocks, despite their efforts of trying to communicate with the crowd. They just threw fruit and veg at them, accusing them of thievery and kidnapping one of the shepherdesses, Cora. Petra showed to join in the fun, and a storm was caught, but Silver made the run for it. It got worse when Coraca had arrived, everyone left, and Tom and Eleanor was stuck in the stocks. Tom and Eleanor watched in horror as Coraca destroyed the town. Soon Eleanor whistled for Silver and freed them from the stocks, but when they reached Storm, their weapons had been taken. Tom and Eleanor assumed that the beast could be one could be once a human. I don't know how they jumped to that conclusion, but they figured it out. Yeah, so they think it's, it was a human, as they saw the, the look in her eyes and the ripped clothes. Yeah, okay, that's good evidence to support that. Tom went over to Chris, one of the captors, and demanded their weapons so they could fight off Koraka. Chris agreed if they could help him find his son. However, it turns out Koraka had taken him in her talons and flew off. Tom assured Chris he would return his son, and Chris saw the look in his eyes of trust. Returning their weapons, Chris promised them a reward for their services, and Tom ignored, saying he didn't do this for reward. Mind you, he could have asked for food, since the whole point of coming here was to get a meal, you know. But Tom and Eleanor head off until they reach Koraka's mountain. Tom told Old Ellen to stay here with Storm and Silver. Despite her fa face of reluctance, she agreed, and Tom eventually reached the top, where he found Frida and Koraka. Koraka's nest, that is. Not Frida and Koraka's nest, you know. There was also some minor stuff with Petra, but that was more of standard taunts from her, so it wasn't really necessary to put in here. Tom gave away his location to Frida and told him to be quiet. However, when Frida was free, Tom was unsure how to get him out of here, but then Koraka returned and she was pissed. Tom tried to fight her off, but she easily dodged his attacks. Eventually, Tom remembered Eagle Feather from Arcta. He told Frito to grab hold of him and they jumped off the mountain, gliding down safely. However, Koraka was coming in fast. Tom and Frito were close to the ground, but Koraka had them in her talons. Despite Tom telling Frida to let go, he was too scared, but Tom decided to tickle Frida in order for him to fall and be caught by Eleanor. Tom was on a wild ride, hanging from his shield, as Koraka swung him about. Soon enough, he had lost his grip of his shield and pulled out his sword and stabbed into the rock, into the rock to break his impacting speed. As he was flung from the shield, but then, Koraka landed on the top of the ledge where Tom was, where Tom was. While Eleanor was trying to pull out the right token, soon enough Tom believed that the whistle was the right one. 
but it wasn't working, and despite Tomnik knocking away Korraka's spear, it wouldn't be a matter of time before she retrieved it and flew back up. Tom looked like he was he was screwed as Korraka lifted him up in her claws, but in the ev but in a, but then of course every bird in Seraph came swarming around Korraka. When the birds pecked her in the way of battle, he led them back to the town. This is a result of the um, whistle. It did work. It was like a dog whistle, only infecting not hearing the beast or Tom, but the birds of Seraph. Where Tom, anyway, Tom made reached the town, and where Tom had made his escape, he crashed into a hut, but was quickly recovered. However, he heard another crash outside, and came to the conclusion he hoped that the person was alright because he didn't want the beast to be killed because he assumed it to be a human with the ripped clothes. Tom ran to the beast to make sure she wasn't dead. He found Karaka's spear and saw the beast planning to escape. He tossed Karaka's spear into her own wing and she bled out purple poison. Tom, no Tom noticed this as Malvo's magic. Chris was angry, believing that Karaka had killed Frido until his son cried out. He was there. And then Karaka was now unable yeah, and then Koraka was now unable to fly anymore, which caused her the spell to break. That's what, that's just my theory of why the spell broke how it did, because she was her wings were busted and she was unable to be the winged assassin anymore, so that's why the spell broke. Um so yeah, spell break. She reverted back to Cora the Shepherdess. Chris thanked Tom and offered him a feast for their victory. This time Tom accepted it, but only for one night, as he knew every day we, they may, they will, every day will make Malvo that much closer to reaching the Eternal Flame. And that is Koraka the Winged Assassin. Overall, I have to say this is the weakest book in Series 9 so far. Because of uh, two of, of, of a couple things. One, the food point that I've mentioned before. Two, Ursus's harp was brought up here, and that was smashed for the, on the first book. And um, the fact that you've got Tom, and yeah, Tom is another thing. In this book, in yeah, it's happened off in the other two books, but this one is an extension of what his problem is in this series. He seems to be reluctant to allow others to help him. I think this has happened in past series, but with the way he um, doesn't want Eleanor to get involved, it's kind of a letdown for her character not to do much. But I think... In our next book review, we will get some Eleanor more involved. Because even though Koraka is the weakest book for me so far, I do like the it's one redeeming element is the fact that Malvo turns a human into a beast, which is kind of unique for the series, which is its only redeeming element I can find, really. Because, you know, you're dealing with actual human life here. And uh, that's kind of a bummer. So, Tom has to be careful of what beats he kills in and tries not to. So, like I said, Eleanor might get a better role in the next book because next time is the book review that I've been waiting to do. I've reviewed this book before because it looks so awesome, the concept of it looked awesome in general, but it's been a while since I've read that. And I'm happy to say, with great ex determination and hope for this book, that Series 9 can make a comeback with it. Because our next review is... Silver the Wild Terror. Mm-hmm. That's silver. Till next time, guys. Like, subscribe. All that good stuff. Peace. Hey, guys. Welcome back to Beast Quest. Series 9... Book 4, Silver the Wild Terror. And after the mess of Koraka, I'm glad to say this is definitely the best book of Series 9 so far. And to be fair, that's quite an easy achievement to do, because before this, the best book was Minus, and that was only for obvious reasons, because Koraka was total garbage and Ursus was just set up. But I can safely say, Silver... The Wild Terror is the best book, and I'm very happy to say that. With that being said, I want to get over this story, because this could be the turning point of Season 
Series 9, that could make the remainder of it, the last two books, good. And I'll get through to that in my overall um, plotting of, the, of this. But with that being said, let's get on with this. Tom and Eleanor were eating their food, food, and Tom insisted more for their journey. Tom saw that the map was taking them to, a nor to the northern mountains, but there was no beast, which made Tom think Malva was up to something. Chris also observed the map and said that, said that there was packs with dangerous wolves. One of them, one of one was the only one of them was, the, yeah, one of the only things to fear in Seraph, other than Malva and Petra. Chris also offered them some warm fleeces to face the bitter cold. For Storm, Tom and Eleanor. As they rode off, to, rode off, Eleanor informed them that they had only three tokens left. I said before Minus that I wasn't sure if Tom still had the harness, since Tom still had the remains of Ursus's harp in Koraka, but this book does confirm they only have three tokens. Tom was also uncertain. He actually hoped they would face this beast soon, as he didn't like the feeling Malva was hiding the beast. Clearly, he felt that Malva was up to something. Tom and Eleanor eventually reached the northern mountains. That w w that proved fierce, forcing Tom and Eleanor to ride off Storm and push along through the snow. After seeing some wolves in the distance, they were soon caught off as the snow pulled Storm down into a chasm. Despite Tom and Eleanor's chances of rescue, it was too late. Storm had been swallowed by the snow. Tom, Eleanor and Silver climbed down the chasm to rescue Storm as they heard his animal cries. He was still alive. Eventually they reached the bottom. The bottom. They, they reached the bottom. They dug out Storm and mended his broken leg with the green jewel. Soon enough they made their way through, through and out of the crevice. With the help of Nanook's bell, Tom noticed a cave for, the sh for a shelter, and when they got in, Tom was still concerned. There was no beast. Eleanor assumed they may not face a beast this time, but Tom wasn't going to be believed that. Just then, Silver began eating some strange meat. He growled at Eleanor, and Tom was concerned. Yeah, he is concerned a lot in this book, Tom is. Silver ran off into the corner of the, of the cave, surrounded by darkness. Tom examined the meat, looking at it at its rotten state. He quickly tossed it outside. Eleanor got Silver back, and he appeared to be back to his old self. Soon our heroes came across a camp full of people. They joined them and explained Silver was a tamed wolf. It wasn't long, however, until Silver observed the fire. He grew mad and started to wreck the camp, defying Eleanor. And Tom noticed that there was green magic coming from Silver's legs. A man cri cried that the wolf isn't tamed at all, and he planned to kill it. A huge man pulled out a dagger, but Eleanor got some got some badass lines claiming if they kill attempted to kill Silver, she would make them regret it. Such powerful lines from Eleanor. As Silver ran away, Tom noticed Silver changed size. He grew bigger. Quick thinking, Tom grabbed grabbed the map, hoping his assumption was was wrong. But of course, dropping it to his knees, that was enough to prove that he was right. Silver was the next beast. Calmly putting away the map, he can't down Eleanor and passed her the map. Eleanor wailed in such agony, Tom com comforting her, saying that they would get Silver back and they would s s and they stood strong. Tom knew they had to catch up with Silver, but he also knew Silver had been been with them nearly from the start, so he knew Tom and Eleanor's fighting skill better than any beast. Tom quickly asked the people if they could borrow a sledge. Of course, the people said no, as they said, if I... They said, if I plan to take, if you plan to take it, they'd stop them. Yeah, so, because, you know, this wolf just attacked their camp. Do you honestly think that they're going to let you take their sledge, Tom? I don't think so. Of course, Tom explained their situation about Malvel summoning beasts to, pre to prevent them from reaching him, and how he turned their animal friend into one. The people agreed to look after Storm, and allowed them to borrow their sledge, but if they didn't return it before the full moon, the horse was theirs to keep. It was agreed, and Tom rode off. And now, before I continue on, this is a nice callback to previous books. I think Amictus did it, and um, somewhere in the past, but this was a nice element that was brought back to the old books of the classics, which were around um, five or six. But I can't remember a specific book exactly, but there were books like this previously, which we've had on our journeys, and it's nice to bring that element back. Tom rode off with Edda on the sledge, and they eventually found Silver's prince, and Silver himself. His transformation was complete. 
spiked fur, scythe-like claws, muscular body, piercing eyes of slave, piercing eyes and slavering jaws. Eleanor could, Eleanor could do it. She hadn't had the strength ain't, to fight back against her bestest friends in the world. But Tom knew they had to do this for not just Silver and not just Sarah, but for all the known kingdoms. But then Silver howled and summoned the Northern Wolves. Tom and Eleanor prepared to fight Silver, but he easily saw their move coming. Despite Eleanor's trying to reason, he was fully taken by Marvel's spell. Silver got rid of Eleanor's quiver and Tom's shield. He had to think fast and use the sword to fend off Silver. Tom said they had to split up, but even when that didn't work, of course, and Tom was surprised, Silver leapt above them with his full body weight and crashed down. It turns out the area they were on was a riverbank. It broke the ice and everyone got out of there, Silver leaping to the other side of the river while Tom and Eleanor took out the wolf pack, sending them into the river one by one, making them go downstream. Silver leapt back and seized Eleanor's mouth, so that's where it got interesting. And I'll show you that um, iconic picture where you've got Silver the Beast with Eleanor in his jaws. He's not holding back at all, so there is no um, concern. He's not changing his side, like, he's full on evil mode. Tom yeah. attempted to rescue, but Eleanor, despite being in pain, was alright. Her woolly tunic prevented Silver from putting force and force onto her. And plus, maybe I, maybe he doesn't want to, as to show there is a small trace of Silver still in there. That's what I personally think. Anyway, that's not in the book, that's what I personally think why Silver didn't, you know, fully killer because there's a small element in there that's bursting out and that's why I think he didn't do it. Anyway, Tom figured out that the potion was one of the tokens and that was the one they needed. He soon figured out that the potion reacted to water so after being flung back near the river, Eleanor had tossed from Silver's mouth and lay unconscious in the snow. Tom had to do, do this not just for Eleanor but for the all known kingdom's sake. Tom used his dual powers to fling himself on Silver's back and try to get a potion near Silver's eyes. But the ride was hard. Silver's spiky fur was painful. It got to the point where Tom had dropped the potion. Tom saw Eleanor recovering and Tom told Eleanor to grab the potion and plunge her arrowhead in the in the stuff and then fire it at Silver's forehead. She had, she had it ready but of course it was hard to attack your best friend. But with inner strength she shot Silver. Tom fell, fell off Silver and the beast crashed into his side. They thought he was dead, but when, but then when he woke to his normal size, happiness was there until Marvel showed up. He claimed, despite the fact that they had defeated another of his beasts, he was nearly at the Eternal Flame, because you can see it in the distance. He stole the sledge that Tom had borrowed from, from the people, and Petra, the witch, tried to catch up on her, um, tried to catch up with her master. However, however, believed he had no further use of her, so he whipped her off her an her anacorn and left her in the snow. We also learn in this um, chapter that Noctus, w Noctus, Noct we also learn that Noctus, Petra's anacorn, is from Seraph, and she corrupted the creature to make it obey her. So that's how she got it. Um, finally, Tom and Eleanor surrounded Petra, silver growling. Petra began twisting the situation from telling they needed her as she had secrets of Malvel, from saying she meant to be left behind to take out the he our heroes, but despite Petra's words, no one was of course trusted her. However, Tom's good heart decided to take her with them, facing the remaining beast and to stop Malva as she also held secrets of him. Lucky Storm had managed to escape from the campers and they had previously met, and they tied Petra and walked ahead, wondering how things would progress from here. And with that, that is the end of this book, and of course, Oh my god, such a great book. This is what we needed from Series 9. It needed to come back and it came back with awesomeness. First of all, the concept of turning s silver evil was a great idea. I mean, back in my school days, I saw this book as I was looking up Beach Quest books. I said, oh, I just want to read this personal book because this is a great idea. And the fact that it's Malva makes perfect sense because he's the villain they've had most popularly... So he makes sense that he would know this. He's wondering why he took this time to do this. But of course, this series fits in well with 
at all. Ursus being a creature, Minus being a creature, Koraka being a person, all corrupted by evil, and it all fits. And I think it also blends in as well, because Petra seems to be um sort of corrupted by evil, where she has Malvel sort of, you know, going her way. But she is her own, she's a minion of Malvel, so she couldn't be, but I'm just saying there is an opportunity, you know, there. And we also see people corrupted by, um, like, Chris and Koraka, and then you've got the, um, people, understandably so, upset on what's happened. And the thing that I like, another thing that I like about this is how I, um, I didn't like this, I like this book more, actually, the second time round, because I saw the build-up of Silver becoming evil, it wasn't overwhelmed, it was like you had three or four chapters before, before the transformation, Around chapter 5, you saw the torment in his eyes, the fire being, like, a taming lust. And then the green magic bursting around. It all built up, and it exploded. And you can see it right there in the wording. And the fact that Eleanor got back in the series with a with promising role. She couldn't believe how her trusted ally had gotten down this path. Storm Storm was taken away from this, but that was okay. It gave our two main leads more centre focus and um, less diversion. Tong used his dual powers again to help things out. He even used his, to his shield tokens, which is a nice plus. Not to mention the fact that, you know, Eleanor, like I said, she gets more of a role. Tom, he actually has a different role. He actually improves in this book more than he normally does. Normally he goes in the um, gun-ho action hero type vibe, but this time he was more held back, concerned, patient, waiting, thinking this out, because he knew how Silver is the most smartest beast because of how close he is to them, but they also know Silver, but they also don't know him at the same time because of his new abilities. So it gave Tom quite some challenging, I'm glad to see how calm and tamed he was, because someone had to be calm, while Eleanor was in this agonizing state of worry and dread for her friend. And then you've got the ending, which was brilliantly done with the potion the and it had to be dipped with an arrow from Eleanor. It it was the right thing to do. I'm glad Eleanor got the final blow in to end this because it was her it it was this book was mainly about her suffering and you know, she had to end this poison that was on Silver's mind. And it was hard for her because, you know, you think this beast's gonna die, but of course we know he's not because, you know, he's you see him in other books, but, you know, if you're not reading from that other point on, you know, this could be a big changing point, but overall, an excellent book. And I, it's another book where Tom rides a beast, like in Koran, which we had last series, nice callbacks there, and the snow, for like Nanook and all that stuff, awesome. I mean, there's a lot of good little details to point out. Then the wolf pack, which is like the only, according to Seraph, one of the only things to fear, which is a nice added element. And the uh, fact that n we got um, Storm back in danger with the uh, from the beginning was a nice callback to um, Nanook as well, because I said in that in like that video or that review or um, in Sephron that he was um, in the earlier series. He was. Um, kind of taken out a lot earlier on. It was nice to bring those classic elements back. And then we've got the ending with Petra, you know, her, um, that, I thought that was like, there's no way you could get better than this, but then the ending came round, and then you've got Petra, now a sort of ally to the team. And that was, oh my god, Malva left her, and such, such awesomeness. But, you know, it's all building up to this one big event, because now Petra's their, like, sort of ally. And we've got Malvel heading to the Eternal Flame. Can she... And she's going to help with the other two beasts. With Spike Finn and I think Torpex, was it? Yeah, I think that was the other one. So it's nice that... And they're both lizard-like creatures. And it's all coming down. Will... And you're off... You're wondering, like I am, if you haven't seen... You know, will Petra turn on our heroes? Will she take over as the big bad for the finale? I don't know, I'm excited, just like you guys are. But next time, guys, this has been a great review of the Warlock Star. Silver, The Wild Terror, awesome book. Easily the best one of Series 9, and one of the best books overall in Beast Quest, I can easily say. 
But with that being said, this has been another Re Beast Quest review, and uh, this is another good element for Series 9 to come back. Next time we'll be taking on Spike Finn, that Water King guy. So, you know, Spike Finn. Till then, like, subscribe, all that good stuff, and join us next time as we tackle another Beast Quest with Spike Finn. Hey guys, welcome back to Beast Quest. Series 9, Book 5. Spike Finn, the Water King. Now before I get on with this, I want to apologise because my voice isn't 100% right now. I um, had an accident and I caused myself to bit my tongue, but other than that, I've gone over a bit and uh, it's um, it's gotten a bit better and it's it should be well enough to uh, wrap up series um, 9. With that being said, I hope this goes pretty well, and uh, let's wrap this up. So, with that being said, this is Spike Finn, the Water King. Tom and Eleanor ventured forth, closing in on the mountain where the eternal flame lit. What, with Petrus, Petrus still as a prisoner, Tom realised they should make camp. Tom told Petra to tell them Malvel's secrets, and she explained that the closer Malvel gets to the eternal flame, the Warlock's staff with him will be the heavier, the heavier it will become. Meanwhile, Noctis fears fire, so, he, you know, Noctis the Anacorn, he fears fire, so he will have to go on foot to reach the flame. This tells me that the staff, or perhaps Adro, or past good wizards, put a counter effect on the staff to weaken the, weaken the being holding the staff, as a way of preventing he slash she of reaching the flame. Tom and Eleanor were having trouble making a campfire, and Petra said she could make fire with her magic if she was untied. Despite the fact of not trusting her, they eventually did, and everyone was concerned what happened next. Also, from this, from this chapter, it tells us that Noctis now shows allegiance just to Velmal, which must have been a counter spell from Malvel, which means he was planning to leave Petra for quite some time. Because you know how evil wizards are, they don't really care for their underlings m most of the time. Petra of course didn't run, but attempted to steal Tom's sword. Failing, she lit, lit, the, fire, lit the fire with green flames. Tom never asked why doesn't she change her evil ways and help them. She said why to she didn't want to end up like Adro, because, you know, a, we saw how good wizard Adro ended up on the side of good. He died, and she didn't want to say his fate. Tom shouted, saying, saying once, once, he returned, once he returned the staff, Adro would be back to life. They assumed, they assumed this, of course. Petra laughed, saying Adro is gone forever, and Tom hoped she was wrong. They checked the map, now in, in, now in this chapter they say... They got the map from Adra, which is not true at all. In Ursus, they got the map from Petra. Besides, Adra said he didn't want them to go to Seraph, so why would he give them a map? So it's a bit of continuity. This, this series has a lot of continuity, especially on books 3 and 5, which is this one, which are both human beasts. But don't worry, this book is, in the, this is not as bad as Korak, and nothing will be... Anyway, carrying on. Anyway, seeing the map, they noticed that a beast called Spike Finn was attacking the fishermen. This beast was probably created a while ago when Tom and Eleanor were fighting other beasts. And Malvel is right now heading for the mountains while the beast remained at sea. He could have also remembered this, so he probably knew he could use it to slow down our heroes. Petra taunted them with what they planned to do. Either option had consequences. If they followed Malvel, people would be hurt. But if they stopped the beast, Malvel would get closer or actually reach the eternal flame. Reluctantly, Tom decided to save the people and stop the beast to prevent lives. To prevent the lives they have a chance of saving now. Then, fearing Malvel, mind you, Tom hoped he was making the right choice. So I liked that little tension we have there. Of course, we know Tom's going to choose Stop Spike Finn because there wouldn't be a book otherwise. Well, for this book, after all. 
Um, Tom and friends made their way to the Seas of Seraph. They realised they had they had to build a raft if they planned to stop the beast quickly and, you know, using speed, a speed device, and stop Melville. However, despite gathering many logs, they had no rope. The only rope that they had was on Petra. They had no choice. They untied her, and Tom told Eleanor to take Storm while he took Silver and Petra on the raft. They all finished the raft and sailed away. However, after fighting the tide and a whirlpool, Petra knocked Tom out, and Silver was was splashed by the water to too wet to get a clear view of Petra. She had made her escape when Tom came to, with Ella and a screaming, seeing what happened. A waterfall came up over Tom and Silver and went over. So, uh, that was, they didn't have their Petra for too long, did they? Tom uses his token from Sepron to face the waters. He and Silver were actually in the Sea of Seraph, and Tom vowed to get Petra for this. But even no, Eleanor had Petra in range. Tom told her to let her go, as she was not worth it. Tom thought she could change, but it was clear to Tom now she didn't care about our heroes or Malva. All she cared about was herself. She left them to face Spike Finn, who quickly emerged after seeing the village close to the shores. Spike Finn revealed himself, and Tom, and Tom was at his disadvantage, fighting him in the ocean. Spike Finn revealed his trident and plunged it down to plunged it down once. Tom dodged it by going underwater, but when he came up again, the trident came back. Tom dodged the trident, but Spike Finn managed to get his teeth into Tom's shield and actually caused some damage to it. After a little brawl in the ocean, Spike Finn retreated and Tom w and Tom wound wound up to the shore, where not only Eleanor, Silver and Storm greeted them, but also a couple of fishermen. They said they saw the fight and explained how Spike, Spike Finn had taken their, their fish away. And anyway, one of their fishermen, of course, all they knew about him... Their fishermen... And where was that? Taking away their fi one of their fishermen. All they found was found of Brenner was his ripped clothes. Tom and Ellen exchanged looks and knew what was going on. Brenner is Spike Finn. They had seen this before with Koraka. The fishermen decided to take them to their village leader, Vara, and made their made, and made their way, leaving Storm and Silver at some supplies while they ventured forth into the village until they reached Vara's house. Tom explained the beast could be Brenner. Vara wasn't so trusting after the last visitor, who turns out to be Malvel, the one who cast the spell. Vara also explained that Malvel was now using the warlock's death as a cane, which he, which he was getting weaker. Petra's words seem to be true. Also, if Malvel is weaker, it means the beast could have been right after Silver not a while ago, which means Malvel went ahead of course if he's planning to distract our heroes with another beast. So a while ago I said I figured that maybe this beast was a backed up plan but if he's weak because he's getting close to the flame then this is like a p right after Silver not hold it back. Spike Finn came back and he planned to knock down Vara's house. Spike Finn flooded Vara's house while Tom and Eleanor gathered a net to try and trap Spike Finn. However Tom had forgotten his shield so he couldn't use his Sephron's tooth. While the net trap seemed to work, it wasn't long for Spike Finn used his spikes on his forearms to break free from the net. After some scuffling in the sea, Tom and Eleanor retrieved Tom's shield. Tom also mentioned Spike Finn was stronger than he thought. However, Spike Finn burst through the room and surprised them. I will say Spike Finn does like to use his spikes on his forearms a lot, which is pretty damn cool. I always like that thing in beasts using their own bodies, you know. Tom and Eleanor fought off Spike Finn, causing Tom and the beast to be hurt. Spike Finn made a retreat while Tom and Eleanor had to decide which token was the one they needed. Tom took the two from his shield, and which is where Spike Finn had bit. He tested it on the chainmail and conjured a plan. With himself bleeding, he used the, he used he would use it to lure him. Lower Spike Finn, that is, to him. 
So he would use his blood like a shark to lure to Spike Finn to get him. The chainmail would would drown him, but Sephron's tooth would keep him his breath his breathing power active. This the plan was to lure Spike Finn out of the sea, where he didn't hold an advantage. Tom also told the people that Brenner was the beast, much to their horror, and prepared to face Spike Finn once again. Tom asked everyone to hold onto a chain, which he had secured around the chainmail. When he gave the signal, they would pull him up. Tom went down and and his blood did had, did attract something, but it wasn't Spike Finn, it was a swarm of sharks. Tom fought them off, and then when all the sharks were left in panic, Spike Finn had arrived. Yeah. Spike Finn had arrived. Tom, had, Tom and Spike Finn fought, with Spike Finn getting his teeth stuck in the chainmail. Tom was basically a hook, and he tugged he took on the chain to reel in their beastly catch. They all came with ropes and coiling up Spike Finn. Despite Spike Finn's efforts attempts to re return to the water, it was no use. The battle had been decided. Spike Finn reverted back to Brenner and was no longer no longer a part being in the sea. Because, you know, it's similar to Koraka, how her wings were damaged and she was meant to be like a flying beast. With her wings are damaged, she no longer can be the flying beast. It's the same thing here with um, Spike Finn. No longer in the water, he's no longer a watery beast. And Tom went to greet him back to Seraph. Tom, and, uh, uh, Tom explained what had happened to Brenner, and of course Vara's people offered a feast. Only this time they couldn't stay, not while Malva had grown a head start on them. But Vara looked at their map, which, from Pe which was from Petra, and she said that that is Vara, she said that the, there are, the mine shafts were on here, our heroes could use them to make it to the eternal flame in less than a day's travel. However, they, had, they heard Petrus laugh and wondered if she overheard their plans. Tom said if she did, they would be ready for her. Renner offered, offered to be their guide to say thanks for freeing him from the spell, and they headed off saying, one more beast, one more token. To be honest, if Maldor, Maldor's new power can create beasts any time he wants, he could make easily more than just one more extra beast. Mind you, he's probably planning to destroy the staff anyway, so that's probably why he's limited to just six. Or a number of few. It's just convenient that it's six. I know there's a the Beast Quest series formula sticks with six. I know present day right now it's not gone down to four, but... You know... There are some little, it's another one of those rhymes of series 9. But overall that is book 5 of series 9, Spike Finn. It's easily better than Koraka as the, the second beast to be turned into from a human. It's, it, there's not much plot holes and even that plot hole with Tom refusing few was justified because Mal was sort of getting an upper hand on them. And I did like the whole thing with going back to the sea. It did remind me, there were some elements of like the Sephron stuff and the water. They always pull up these sea beasts really well. And I'm always happy to see that. And uh, I apologise if uh, my wording was a bit off today. Because like I said before. But hopefully this was a good review. I might edit out a bit, see if I can. But I hope you guys have enjoyed it. With just one more beast to face. Torpix. The snake, basically. Oh, and as for rankings on this book, I'm gonna say it's not as good as Silver, that's easy enough. Let's see, um, what was the best book before that? That was book four, so... Minus was the best book before that. Is it better than Minus? I'm gonna say it is. It is the second best book, so... Because... The, there weren't many complaints the whole, there were some complaints I had with that involving Minus, but it was like, basically Minus was the average Beast Quest book, so I think, with a little, there was a bit more development, there was a bit more pushing forward, and with Series 9 coming to a whole, this is easily the second best book in um, Series 9 for me, so. Still, Silvery is the king of Series 9, but Spike Finn is an easy number 2. Till next time guys, peace. Hey guys, welcome back to Beast Quest, Series 9, Book 6. 
Topics The Twisting Serpent and the last book of series 9. So let's get this all wrapped up. Now before I start I will point out that the prologue did throw me off guard with a couple of surprises. One I guessed one I guessed would happen but two that uh, didn't that I didn't think of. First, Malvel reaches the Eternal Flame only to only for it to be guarded by a vine trap. He gets past it despite being weak, however it turns out the last beast is actually guarding the Eternal Flame. Now Adro told us that Seraph has no beasts to his knowledge, so maybe he didn't know, because I don't think he would lie. Or maybe since Malvel has been creating some beasts, maybe it's a taste of his own medicine, a result of it. Anyway, Petra shows up, she ends up getting the Warlock Staff, and Malvel ends up down the Torpic's throat, you know, the Snake Beast. I did say I saw a slight chance of Petra becoming the big bad, and it seems to be the case. So I assume she's gonna lead our heroes, um, lead our heroes to beat Torp, let, you know, let our heroes beat Torpex, and then take the staff into the Eternal Flame. Also, last review, I did accidentally said Velmal at one point in, in that review, so apologies for that. Anyway, um, let's go on with the overall, uh, plot now. Tom and Eleanor were now in the mine shafts, hoping to catch up before Malvel reached the Eternal Flame. However, Eleanor had been, had, had a bad feeling about, had a bad feeling, and soon so did Tom. They found themselves to be in, into caves with diamond-like walls, and the crazy reflections were driving Storm mad. Tom wondered if they were they were magic. Of course, he did want to stick. Or he didn't want to stick around and pressed on. However, at some point, a diamond had struck Tom, passed through his tunic and into his flesh. As the diamond walls came closing in, Tom's friends refused to leave him, and despite receiving some pain, he was free. Soon they came across Petra, and she claimed she felt sorry for, retreat, for, for treating Tom so badly, and apologised by showing them out of the diamond tunnels, and up towards the exit where not only the eternal flame was, but also the forest of vines. Before venturing forth, Tom wondered where Malvel was, as he had, as he had a, as he had a head start on them. And secondly, their map indicated that the beast was the beast was right near their location. This makes me think if Torpex is the only actual beast of if Torpex is the only actual beast of Seraph, or is he one of Petra's since he's like since he's the only one, he's also on the map, unless the map just reveals all beasts. Anyway, Tom, ten Tom attempted to get through the vines, and their magic seized them, and got them in their clutches. Petra had made her way, made her escape, while the vines captured Tom and Eleanor. Soon enough, Tom drew his sword and cut down the vines that coiled him and Eleanor. Tom noticed Petra had left, and he assumed Petra knew about them, about them, which of course she did. Tom needed to hurry to, as he feared Malvel would eventually reach the staff. He wished, or not, not the staff, the uh, flame. He wished, he wished, he, you know, he wished he had the golden boots so he could jump over the vines, but instead he had another idea. By using Storm and the running speed of Tagus's horseshoe, they could jump over the vines. This meant they would have to leave Silver behind, so Eleanor told him to stay here. If he saw Malvo, to alert them with a howl, but not engage him. Saying, fa saying their farewell, they jumped over the vine bushes. This is where Storm's hardest challenge comes into play. He successfully jumps over the vines. Our heroes rest after some discussing. However, they, however when Tom awoke, he met the last beast, Torpex, who had coiled him up and Eleanor as well. Storm was the only one who could help them, and he put up one hell of a fight, allowing Tom and Eleanor to break free and retrieve their weapons. Tom also put together there must be a connection to Torpex and the Eternal Flame, as they, as 
they ever since they encountered the flame, its its fire felt cold, and they also knew that the snakes are cold blooded. It got worse when Tom Nellano blinded Tom was blinded by Torpix's acid. This info adds into my theory of Torpix actually being from Seraph, unless Petra created him to guard the flame and she knew about it in a great detail, which I doubt so. I am I was thinking at the time that he's from Seraph. Tom, despite being blinded, uses Eleanor's directions to help fight off Torpix. However, it turns out none of the, their weapons had no effect. They had, but they remembered the last token, the dagger. They also assumed that this beast to be, create, to be created from the Eternal Flame as the way of protecting itself. Which means Seraph does have the power to create beasts, I guess. It never did before, as there was no danger until now. Anyway, Torpix didn't attack until Tom got close to Eternal Flame. With the dagger now in hand, he tricked Torpix into showing his weak spot, his belly. He didn't intend to kill him, just caused him slight pain. But the dagger had more power than, he, than it seemed. Torpix went down in one slash of the dagger. Closing his eyes, Tom wondered what he had done. Not sure why Tom is complaining if the flame created Torpix, they can just recreate the beast or make a new one entirely. Tom saw Torpix's weakened spot exposed expose a body. It was Malval. He explained he explained and he attempt, he attempted to face Torpix, but was overwhelmed and now thanks to Tom he he killed Torpix, the good beast of Seraph, that protected the eternal flame. As well the the magic vines had protected the flame, Tom let the these words get to him and took his rage on Malvel when Eleanor stopped trying to trying to not get him in Malvel's level. They also were aware he didn't have the Warlock's staff as they attempted to take Malvel as their prisoner. But Tom's guard dropped, dropped. Malvel swept the dagger and now he, he had Eleanor in his clutches. Malvel agreed to let her go if he, if he helped him get the Warlock's staff back He could, so he could burn it in the Eternal Flame. He explained how Petra had stolen it from him and Tom was stuck. He had no choice, but then Silver bought with his bond for Eleanor, and possibly his anger for Malvel for what he did to him in that previous book, not to mention the vines now weakened due to Torpix's death, due to, yeah, due to Torpix's death, allowed Silver to break through and rescue Eleanor from Malvel. It was a, it was a success, and Malvel was cornered. He didn't want to be locked up again, so he decided to, he decided his fate in the eternal flame, burning himself to death. Whether he was truly gone remains unknown, but Tom believed there was no way he could have survived that. Petra then arrived and planned to destroy the Warlock's staff, now of Torpex, and Ma now of Torpex dead. She and um, turns out she, she doesn't know that Malvel's dead. Tom, Tom threw his shield like a frisbee and knocked Petra down, allowing Eleanor to recover the staff. Then Torpex had re-emerged his wounds, where he healed and where they were, they were healed, of course, and Tom used the Red Jewel to communicate to Torpex and explain they would take Petra back and put her behind bars for her crimes. Torpex formed the vines into an arch to allow our heroes a way out. Torpex disappeared back to his resting place in the Eternal Flame. They found their way into a portal which Petra was planning to use to escape back to Avantia. The portal led to King Hugo's palace and they gave Petra to the guards, who escorted her into the dungeon. They also told her that her master was killed in the fire. She said she would break out like Malvel did, but Tom claimed that if she did, he'd be ready for her if that happened. They returned the staff to the king, to King Hugo, and also Adro was indeed alive. Returning the staff did restore him to life. Their theory, their theory was right all along. They also explained that Malvel had been burnt in the eternal flame, which made Adro grow concerned. Avantia may be safe now, but he feared what dangers awaited them ahead. Because, yeah, you know, Malvel being burnt inside the eternal flame could be a good thing or a bad thing, because we don't know. That is the fearful thing. And this book, overall, there were some good elements with... Um, it's switching it around. One minute it's Malvel, the big bad, then it's Petra, 
And then we have Torpex, who is this beast who is actually from Seraph, who is actually guarding it, which is a nice twist. This book throws me quite with many twists and turns. And I, I can say the last three books, overall, Series 9, I was told, was a bad series. But the last three books, Silver, um, Spike Finn and Torpex, they were, um, they were okay. They weren't half bad. So, I'm going to say, with all that's been said in this book, I'm going to say, will I say, hmm, yeah, I'm going to say this is equally good as Silver the Wild Terror. It had a lot of twists and turns that surprised me and made me question what was going on. And I like the fact of how we have a beast from Seraph, someone guarding it. And there's always that mysterious vibe of what's going to happen in the future. It's good to have Adro back. And with that being said, this has been my review of all Series 9 books. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. And until next time guys, we'll be moving along to Series 10. I'm looking forward to that. Till next time guys, peace.